with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to University Drive. I'm your host, Tamika Lundy. The story of the Sunshine Group is one that is intricately linked with the history of the Bahamas. What started as a quest for economic empowerment at a time when there was a huge appetite for social and economic liberation has become 50 years later an intriguing model for sustainability and wealth generation. Sunshine Holdings recently celebrated its 50th year in existence. On that occasion, one of two surviving original founders of the Sunshine Group, Sir Franklin Wilson, spoke candidly about the vision that brought the partners together business strategies that bore fruit and serving the common good. Here's that conversation with Sir Franklin, a former college council chair and legacy donor to UB, held at University of the Bahamas. Eight young, energetic Bahamian men coming together in 1973 around this bold vision of economic empowerment through cooperating to own and manage large businesses. How did it come to be that in 1973, there was this commonality around that purpose? Well, I would say this. Um, around that time, of course, the struggle for majority rule uh, had been had been achieved. The concept of independence had been affirmed, a date had been set. But young people may not really understand what those two events meant. Let me tell you a story. Anthony, Anthony Thompson graduated from the same university I graduated from. Dalhousie University, mm -hmm. with the same degree. The only difference was he graduated in 1965. I graduated in 1968. Anthony Thompson wanted to be a chartered accountant. Not one accounting firm would offer him a job. In 1968, every accounting firm wanted to offer me a job. What changed? The context. 1967. Mm -hmm. So anyone who doubts the significance of January 10th, 1967, do not understand the Bahamas. Secondly, while by the time we came along, majority rule having been achieved, we saw the political struggle as having been essentially one. But what we did not see was any parallel movement in terms of economic empowerment. And that was, for us, at some point going to be a problem. Karen has mentioned how when we looked around, we only saw one company, one in the whole country, that was formed on the basis of, without regard to blood, in terms of family, one. And that was the People's Family Savings Bank. And by 70-ish, it was clear that, as she said, the forward march had stalled. And they only been together, well, only now. But the fact is, they, they started in the early 50s. So it was only like a 20 year period. So for us, we said that created a sense that we've got to do something. Because it would really be tragic if the bank were to really, if it's stalling, turned into what eventually it did turn into, 
and there was no example we will point to. We thought that would have been unfortunate. So this is the type of thinking that was a part of what we did. And the beauty about this is no one person can claim that idea in its totality. No one person truly can. And it came together because people of like mind and common purpose demonstrating two things, which in the audience today, there's a lady named Janine Horta, got me to understand when I was president, chairman of this council, of the council of this university. To get things done, you need people with fundamentally two things, capacity and inclination. I repeat that, capacity and inclination. The inclination to do whatever it is you want to do. You have to have the inclination. And two, you have to have the capacity. And so uh, all eight of us, we said to do that, we started out, like Karen said, 15. And we said if we raised $100,000, we could start. Well, we didn't end with 15. We ended with eight. And between the eight of us, we found $100,000. $100,000. Now, yes, over time, $100,000 then is not $100,000 today. But the point is, it was enough for us to start. You and your colleagues had a philosophy back then that Bahamians of humble origin could achieve this economic success and wealth generation. Why was it important to be so intentional about that? Bahamian of humble, Bahamians of humble origin, and is there a lesson for us in today's day, time? The significance of that is, fundamentally, that was the same strategy that undergirded the march to success in majority rule. It's the same principle. It's the same principle that undergirded the union movement. We took that same principle and applied it to business. And so that was the intentionality because we had seen it work. We saw it work in politics and we saw it work in the, un in the trade union movement. And that was really the backdrop to it. And so Lyndon, interesting, um, they had on the screen, uh, unfortunately, the lights, the audience couldn't see it, but the significance of it was such that when we opened the Twin Theater, Salinan's primary point in his speech, I hope I will be able to hold up this group as a model for other young Bahamians who want to pool resources. The fundamental key for majority rule was pooling. Mm -hmm. The fundamental key for the trade union movement was pooling. And as fate would have it, when Salinden, uh, the last time Salinden spoke to the country, the last time was the opening of Salinden Pindling Estates, an event sponsored by and organized by the Sunshine Boys. That's got to be God. Let's, look, let's take that, that uh, point you made about pooling a little bit deeper and further. When I sat down with you earlier, you, you were very passionate about the fact that we can do more together than apart. Well, it's fundamental. None of us have $100,000. But together we could find 100. And that's the fundamental principle. And I say to every young person in this country who talk about, I could do this and I could do that if only I had capital. Well, come man. The fact of the matter is pooling is an option. Pooling is an option. And then how you get to even though on average 100,000 divided by eight is 12,000 or whatever the case it is, the fact of the matter is, how do you get 12,000? You gotta save. Mm -hmm. You gotta save something. 
So many people want to start business in no capital, but they're looking for someone else to put up all the capital. No, man, you can't put up all. You got to come with a little something. Got to, you have to bring that little thing, right? Yeah. So I was intrigued when I read the history of uh, Sunshine Holdings, the, the Sunshine Boys. I was intrigued about a couple of things, but one of the first things I was intrigued by is the fact that you and the founders had this stated focus on being passionately committed to survival, right? That was stated, yes. passionately committed to survival. Yes. Survival for me is akin to continuity. Yes. Why were you so intent on there <clears throat> being this focus? We said we cannot fail. We only saw one model, and we saw that model as having stalled. So, so for us, we had to be passionate about it. We, we, we couldn't do this lightly. We were not interested in no crab by this, and nothing was going to stop this. Yeah. No, nothing was going to stop this. So yeah. when people go to Bismarck, Coakley, they, Man, Bismarck, you can't see Frankie Tiefen? <laughs> Bismarck, we start joking among ourselves. How much you think he Tiefen? <laughs> so we start joking, okay? But the point I'm making is we have to be intentional. We could not fail. We could not fail. And, and, and if you start with something you cannot fail, you have to then be passionate about it, and if you're passionate about it, arguments tend not to be, don't have to be fatal. And if you stop to think about it in groups, so often arguments that turn out to be fatal turn out to be fatal for reasons that with hindsight makes very little sense. And so often it is this idea that some decisions on the table and somehow you have to make a final decision tonight. Tonight. Well, you know you do not have consensus tonight. But if you pause, and if you say among your group, look, let's think about this. Let's sleep on this. By the time you come back, someone's had a change in mind. And if you just start saying and developing this concept about less, what the consensus and eventually we developed a concept that look man let's talk until we agree and as we talk until we agree there were some principles no shouting and even though it's all guys no profound language mm -hmm. and you talk until you agree and that worked for us. So let's take this notion and practice of being reflective and strategic to another level. And let's talk about your principal strategies. Um, in that were the core values. Right. In that was also um, investments yes. and the corporate culture. Yes. Here you have back then a group of eight men, right. business-minded individuals, yes between the ages of 25 and 30 in right. the 1970s, right. Right? right? Defining their business vision. Right. So you talked about men of humble origin, but yeah. they were not men of, of humble intellect or imagination. Right. Um, why are core values important <clears throat> for a business to flourish? The point behind it is, there are a lot of people in this auditorium who I suspect what sports. A common thing that sports coaches so often say championships are won on defense. How do you win on defense? You win by minimizing mistakes. So for us in business, it was about minimizing mistakes. And we developed some, some concepts as, to, as to if we do these things, we will reduce the risk of mistakes. Now, what are some of those things? One was some core values. We had the mission, of course. And we had this commitment, we must stay together. 
But beyond that, we have to have some core values. So today, for example, diversification was a core value. You heard Bradley speak there, we didn't want all, all of our eggs in one basket. Another core value was this idea of earning the respect of our partners as being uh, reliable and of our creditors of being trustworthy. So, for example, that value says you can make $10 today and pay out $10 in dividends and when payday come, you ain't got nothing. So, so we, we developed some values. Those values supported us in terms of what we do. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> that wasn't a joke. When Arawak Home started, Royal Bank of Canada, tell you all something. Listen to me carefully. Royal Bank of Canada was a founding shareholder of Arawak Homes. Let me repeat that, a founding shareholder. We didn't borrow anything from Royal Bank. Now just think about that. Royal Bank of Canada becoming a shareholder with these guys. That was for us evidence of us being faithful to that concept that we were reliable and trustworthy. Royal Bank saw that. Now, anyone in this room, over 50, do you think Arawak Homes would have survived all the controversy, all the controversy over all the years if we did not have Royal Bank as a partner? How many times I said to people, we're not crooks. Royal Bank is a partner. <laughs> Makes sense to me. <laughs> so, so, so the fact of the matter is, that was another value, okay? Another principle is, it pays, when you say diversification, now you've got to have some idea, some framework as to which investments, because you have to make choices. You only have so much money. Do you put it in this or do you put it in that? So we created a framework for investments. What framework? When, what do we put it in here or do we put it in there? So that framework was, we're not trying to be everything to everybody. But we choose businesses which have to do with the welfare of the Bahamas in terms of growth possibilities. Housing, people need houses. Bread, people want bread. So we, we were intentional with what we picked. So these were some of the things that helped us to create what it took to avoid mistakes. And the basic principle was avoid mistakes. I like core values. Let's look at some of them that you had, and I'm, I'm assuming you still have them today. Yes. Diversity, reliability, yes. Yes. trustworthiness, yes. the common good, yes. people and technology, and shareholders' value. Yes. Let's look at the common good. Well, <clears throat> see, if it's all about making money, that's not a social objective. That's not a social objective. The fact of the matter is, the common good comes up. You, for us today, you can't be blue chip without a sense of the common good. Blue chip companies do things that build the country. When we started Marathon Bahamas, I'll never forget, we went to see Vincent Van der Poel Wallace. He was the Minister of Tourism. When we spoke to, uh, presented the thing to Vincent, told him what we were doing, the minister. After the press conference, after the press conference, he laughed. He said, now you all could tell Frankie Wilson, we've been trying to do this for the last four years. The Ministry of Tourism could not do it. That was the minister saying it. Private sector has to do certain things. But 
for private sector to do certain things, you have to have some appreciation for that concept of common good. Now, when you link common good, link that to the point what I said earlier about among ourselves, there was we could talk until we agree. No shouting, no foul language. So today, one of the values you talked about there, one of the strategies was this thing about culture. Culture, every house has a culture, every business, every organization has a culture. And so for us today, the culture of the Sunshine Boys is ladies and gentlemen. After Karen came, that's where we got the lady. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, working with ladies and gentlemen. Franon said in his remarks, ladies and gentlemen, working with ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen to build the common good. That's our culture. That's what we do. And that culture is possible. When I talk to every person who comes into uh, the particular company where I spend most of my time, I made the point, I meet with every person, I don't care whether you're an executive vice president or any other role, and we talk. And as we talk, we go through these values, we talk about it, understand it. And so, so we tell people, see, if you go back to the idea about ladies and gentlemen, we were friends, we, 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 we weren't in there talking about women and drinking and Corrupt, you know, this was serious stuff. In fact, there's a point where it's interesting. Any one of you who have not done it, read Sir Clement Maynard's book about the penny bank. Sir Clement has a section in there where he talks about the people's penny saving banks and he talks about the meetings having been so intellectually stimulating. How much how he looked forward to going to the meetings. That was our experience. That was our experience. Going to meetings was fun. And Karen made some really good corned beef and, and tuna sandwiches. <laughs> and good lemonade. Mm -hmm. so, so the fact of the matter is, it was this, this is what, this is what got it. It, 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 this is, it. It's hard to, if you, these are things, hopefully I submit that these are things, if you duplicate these things, I really think you get a shot at being successful. Okay, so take us on the inside now, the inner sanctum, a little bit. What are some of the lessons that you and the founders learned early on about connecting vision and strategy with context, especially as you were aware of what had become of the People's Penny Savings Bank? Well, <clears throat> well as Bradley said in his remarks, you know, Bradley was right on that. I mean, everything ain't milk and honey, every day is not Sunday. This is why I started in the political arena. A common tactic of people who, in politics, so often they come and votes. I got the votes, so let's vote tonight. Because I got the votes tonight. So that's a, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. But that's the way it tends to play out in politics. In business, I encourage people to avoid that. I encourage leaders, even in politics, for the common good of your organization, to, unless you don't consider whether you really have to make that decision that night. What would happen if you took time? Okay? So, so the fact of the matter is, these are all some of the things that go into the question you put to me. I, but I, I think it comes back to this idea of of just taking your time and just being wise. We'll have more of the conversation with Sir Franklin Wilson on the story of the Sunshine Group after this break. Chapter One Bookstore is your back to school headquarters. We are proud to serve the students, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas and the community at large. We are the premier choice for the purchase of university textbooks and supplies and UB logo apparel, paraphernalia, and gifts. 
We also carry a wide variety of school supplies, learning aids, and leisure books. Visit our copy center throughout the semester for all of your printing, copying, and binding needs. Chapter One Bookstore is located on the ground floor of the Michael Elden Complex. Call us at 397-2650 or email us at chapter1 at ub.edu.bs. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chapter One Bookstore. See you soon! Hi, I'm Sonia Farmer and I'm a 2022 Wilson Award Grant recipient. So my research project is called Indelible and it's an oral history archive documenting experiences with and within citizenship with and within the Bahamas. And this project is composed of three parts. Overall, it's a digital humanities project, but there is an oral history archive which contains testimonies um, engaging with experiences with citizenship in this country. The second part is a collaborative art project where the participants also complete an altered voters card however they would like. And the third component is an educational framework which provides toolkits so that we can engage with um, the crisis of citizenship in this country. So even though I'm coordinating this project and I've conceptualized this project, it's really primarily a collaborative project. I will be working with at least um, 50 different people speaking to me um, about their experiences with citizenship to make up this oral history archive. And I will also be working with historians, artists, human rights lawyers, um, and many other folks to create educational frameworks on the website as well so that we can engage with the history of citizenship and the current reality of citizenship. So it's really a collaborative project and I'm really excited to be bringing everyone together to examine what it means to be Bahamian. For more on the Wilson Awards and the Wilson Grants to fuel Bahamian research, contact grants at ub.edu.bs. Welcome back to University Drive and the conversation with Sir Franklin Wilson on the history and legacy of the Sunshine Boys. So over the years, the partners changed. Yes. There were transitions, new people came on. Were they actively recruited? Were they attracted by the philosophy and the business model? Or was it a blend of both? How, well, and how did well, that see, impact your sustainability? New people came through two different strands. Mm -hmm. Through one strand, it was the first thing that Bradley would have referred to when he talked about every day was on Sunday. Well, look, someone in the group had invested. He stayed five years. He knew that his $12,000 or $10,000 today was worth more than what he did on it. And it wasn't a case of him being difficult, but his values had changed. He was getting married. He wanted to build a duplex. And, and if he could cash out now, he could achieve his objectives. Now, the fact of the matter is, none of us necessarily had the money to pay him out, because at that point he wasn't looking for no $12,000 then. <laughs> so, so that's how the early investors came in. We looked for people with inclination and capacity. Orville Turnquest, Herbis Bain, Karen Strawn, don't let them tell you they poor, poor, poor. <laughs> they had capacity mm -hmm. to do what it took for, to raise the money where we could pay the shareholder who wanted to exit without breaking up. So that's one strand, okay? The second strand was as we were growing with diversification, new opportunities came. Like in the video, uh, 75, Bill Holland, Purity Bakery was owned by a company called Continental Baking in the United States. They wanted to sell. Uh, Philip Pinder came to me with the idea. Well, what we did was we structured that in such a way where the original eight all had an opportunity to participate. But, 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 but they didn't have themselves the capacity to buy it all. 
At this stage now, this ain't no 100,000 no more. This is a little more than that. Mm -hmm. so, so the fact of the matter is, uh, and then Bill Holland came to him, and so we, we brought together a group. And so that was one way. Then um, Folk Hall comes along. And uh, similar thing. And uh, so Orville uh, said to us, would we mind if he invited Albert Miller? And so things like that happen. Illustrious and interesting case. Very interesting case. And I say this to all the policymakers here. How did that happen? Albert Miller happens, Albert Sands is a friend. At that time, he was a client of my accounting firm. Albert Sands called me one day. He says, Frankie, he said, listen here, man. Um, the prime minister said, I must call you. He said, call me about what? The story was, Sir Lyndon went to, Albert Sands went to Sir Lyndon and says, listen, South Lucia is dying. Mr. Sweeting, Albert Sands went to Sir Lyndon Penn and said, South Lucia is dying. Warren Tripper died. The Cotton Bay Club had seen its days. He went to Sir Lyndon and said, Sir Lyndon, the government has to buy Cotton Bay Club. Sir Lyndon said to him, Albert, we got these hotels on Cable Beach. You know, I may be straight with you, we can't do that. So Albert said this to Sir Lyndon, he said, but man, the place dying, what you can do, find some, you know. Sir Lyndon said to him, he said, the only answer is we have to try and get some Bahamian investors to take a lead. Sir Lyndon said to him, you know Frankie Wilson? He said, yes. He said, go talk to him. And implicit in what he was saying was the Sunshine Boys. Now it's by 1985, we just started in 73. And the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is saying to a very prominent Bahamian down there, go see the Sunshine Boys to take a lead. And we bought it. And, and you heard what Tommy Terenquist said? Ladies and gentlemen, think about it. Think of what, if Tommy Terenquist's forecast comes to pass. Think of the implication of that for the country. You heard what Tommy said? You saw it was in that, that was Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the point I'm making is by, by that time, sufficient credibility had established in 12 years to the point where the prime minister is saying the government cannot do it. And we came to the thing and we organized the group. And again, again, the time. Royal Bank in that too. Right Royal there. Bank in that too. I told the president of Royal Bank was here a couple of Fridays ago. I told him, when I come back again, now don't tell these fellas stop doing this. <laughs> so, but what am I saying? The point I'm making is, in each of these new initiatives, new partners came. So, William Holland, and others came with Purity, Albert Miller, uh, and others, and Anthony Robinson came with Folk Hall, Albert Sands, Lawrence Griffin, and others from Elutra came from there. And each one was an enriching experience. So continual momentum. Continued momentum. Uh, let's talk about your workforce, yes. your ladies and gentlemen, 99% yes. Bahamian. Yes. Um, I read that there has been an intentional focus on low levels of staff turnover yes. and building cordial relationships. Yes. How did you do this and what has been the impact of that on operations today? What we try hard to do, we, we, we tend to be very intentional about training. See what Karen said? She worked 48 years, for, uh, 40 something years, whatever it is, okay? You look at, you look at Trevor Bridgewater, Chief Architect, Andrew Pinder, Maurice Sims, who said the prayer. He wasn't a bishop when he joined us. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so the point I'm making to you is that, that we try to be intentional about, one, recruiting the right people. Our HR manager talks about putting the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm. Putting the right people on the bus. Two, we're intentional about uh, training. We're committed to development. We, this is what we do. We, this is, and, and we create this culture. Um, one of our newest employees at our Christmas party had only been with us about two weeks before the Christmas party. And she paid us a compliment. I don't know if she realized how much of a compliment she was paying. She said, when she spoke at the Christmas party, she said, this is the most healthy work environment she'd ever been in. Mm. And so the concept about alumni, that's about staff, about alumni, that's an idea I picked up from when I was in the accounting business. Ray Winder, I think, is here. He helped me understand that. So you learn from everybody. The idea in the accounting business, if you're in the professional services business, if you treat your staff right, when they go and they become now the bank manager, they may think of you about bringing you the business. If you didn't burn the bridge from the cross back over. Mm -hmm. So we're intentional. That was something we cultivated from back then. Uh, that, that, that treat people right. Pe treat people right. So important. So important. Today, Sunshine Holdings Limited has thriving enterprises in energy, financial services, real estate, whose successes are grounded in the philosophy of 50 years ago. Right. Has the vision been achieved? Well, <clears throat> the point, the fact of the matter is, the answer is no. You know, again, um, God bless the dead. So Lyndon created a problem for me at that same anniversary when we did the, the uh, opening of Lyndon Pen in the States. He was not there, he was too sick. He participated by radio. And at that occasion, Sir Lyndon, someone asked him something, and he went on and he spoke and he paid a very high tribute to Arthur Hanna and his contribution, commitment to philosophy, and so on and so forth. And then he said something that, man, he said, and Frankie, you gotta do it until you wipe every tear. So let me say this on the radio to people. Call my name. You know how many times I go people everywhere, people come to me, Frankie, so let me say, wipe my tears. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the fact of the matter is, it never stops, because God willing, the country will never stop. And, and while, while the mission about proving where we started, we have intentionally reset our mission because that's been proven. We don't need that anymore. We have a BISEX, we have all kinds of evidence that that's not an issue anymore. We've reset our overall mission and that's where you're Karen talking this thing about being a blue chip. And you heard me in the video talking about from the Bahamas. That's also significant. You heard Anton talking about when we bought Royal Star it was in three jurisdictions, now it's in six. So the idea of being from the Bahamas intentionally recognizes that internationalization is likely to be part of our future if we're gonna be as successful as we want to be. Awesome, so looking back on all of your experiences, the trends, the lessons that you have learned, is there anything that you would have done differently Well, let me put it this way. You could always look back, you woulda, coulda. Like Bradley said, I'm sure there's some things, we, you know, and so on. But at the end of the day, look, with the degree of success the Lord has blessed us with, why ask for more when the Lord has given you more than you dreamt was possible? 
the fact of the matter is, um, today, uh, former Minister of Labor, um, Dion Folks was kind enough to write us a congratulatory letter saying that companies that emanated the Sunshine Boys collectively, collectively, represents one of the 10 largest employer groups in the country. I mean, this, we didn't dream that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there ain't no point worrying about, you know, what you do different or whatever you see. You thank God for what happened. And today, Sunshine Holdings by itself, Sunshine Holdings by itself, has a degree of capital which is not matched by any other company on basics except First Caribbean Bank, which is a regional exercise. Now, that ain't bragging. That ain't nothing but bragging. That is just a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. Also, too, statement of fact. I mean, it's reached a point where today, I say that oh, everyone will be here looking for money. We started with trying $100,000. Today, Today, people call us. Listen, man, we got some money. Could we bring it with you? Not me personally, with the group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with the group. Mm -hmm. So, would we have done anything differently? Yes, maybe, so on and so forth. But look, man, you know, when the Lord gives you so much, you thank God for that and leave the rest for somebody else. What advice do you have for the business person of today, existing and aspiring? Different context than it was when you and your group and your partners formed yourselves. But what's your advice? Well, I believe, I believe I'm, a, I'm an accountant by training. Mm -hmm. And the key to account, accounting, so much of accounting in school is about learning the principles. See, how you do it today is dramatically different with computers from the day when you were dealing with pen and paper. But the principles don't change. The debits got equal to credits. Mm -hmm. so, so look at some of the things I said. At the end of the day, no one of us had the $100,000. But by pooling resources, we could find the 100. Look at what we did in terms of identifying strategies to minimize mistakes, not identifying strategies to go from one to 10, just to minimize mistakes. Note that what I said about, you know, ladies and gentlemen, working with ladies and gentlemen, you know, hopefully people who are listening to this would hear enough that they could say, I could do that too. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And in fact, I truly believe if there's a difference between when we started and what happened today is that too many people got to get the wrong ideas out of their head. And what I mean by wrong ideas, somehow the government got to do it for me. Mm. They got to get that out of the head. We didn't start with that burden because we never looked to the government to do it. Today, get that out of your head. Kennedy said, ask not what my country can do for me. Ask what I can do for my country. And if you, if you start with that type of mindset, people come to me, man, Frankie, I want to be rich. How do you do that? <laughs> Who in the business of trying to make you rich? Sunshine Holdings has seen a lot of changing scenes. Let's talk about the enabling environment. Has that been a huge factor? Well, the enabling environment, whatever the environment is, you know, I tell this audience a story. Let us recognize that politics in this country is a two-edged sword. It's a two-edged sword. The worst thing I say to any business people is go into government depending on the politician to take care of you. John Molly, 
I played tennis on John Morley's court. John Morley was the largest landlord in the country for a period of time. You talk to John, he'd tell you how the Prime Minister Pinland would call him and talk this. I don't think anyone in this country ever thought John Morley was a PLB. You understand? Mm -hmm. Today, truth be told, in our case, where we were politically, and old time and so on and so forth, make that irrelevant. Make that irrelevant. That's, these are some of the ideas I put to people. Sir Franklin, as we stand on the eve of this great nation's 50th anniversary yeah. at an institution that will itself commemorate 50 years next year, yes. what are your hopes and what can you offer as a clarion call for us all? <clears throat> Give the University of Bahamas money. Ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible for the University of the Bahamas to reach its potential entirely with government funding. It is impossible. We have to help. Every alumni of this institution gives something. Give something. Support these people, okay? Don't make this about donating money where the building name after you, whatever the case it is. Give some money for maintenance. Give some money for maintenance. Do things. Don't look for the credit. Don't, don't look for, you know, just, just give this institution money. Support the scholars here. Um, give them a chance to do what they can do. I mean, I came here with this thing here today. I mean, the spirit, these people around here, sit, they're so anxious to do. The, just, I, I, I take this up to thank everyone from this institution who tried to do this stuff. Let's help them. I mean, if, now it's interesting. It's interesting. Look at it. While successive prime ministers have picked persons to be chairman of this board and that board and that board and that board. There's a fair amount of reason to believe that every prime minister who was charged with the responsibility gave very serious thought to who they was going to appoint to be chairman of the board of this institution. There's reason to believe that. Tim Donaldson tells the same story, as a matter of fact, that I taught, told. Perry Christie called me one Sunday night, telling me what would go and telling me he just come from church. Because <laughs> I did not, he knew I was not interested in an appointment. Okay? And so years later, I was succeeded by Tim Donaldson. And Tim Donaldson tell the same story. He owned one Sunday. And while he's on this Sunday, someone pick up the phone and he say, Who's speaking? This Hubert. So he asked me, who would you? Who? <laughs> That's the story. What am I saying that for? Look. Look at the people who have been chairs or even appointed to the board of this institution. Look at it, people. And I believe you would see compelling evidence to believe that the prime ministers of this country, every one of them gave more thought as to who was going to be the chair of this particular institution than might have been the case in pretty much any other. Okay. Well, let's end where we started. 50. A good number. Thank you, Karen, for telling me the scripture. So Franklin, thank you for sharing with us through your lens. Thank you so much, and thank you to you all.
With that, we end this episode of University Drive. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us next time for another edition. I've been your host, Tamika Lundy, for University Drive. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations and the Communications and Creative Arts Academic Unit at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.